Hello everyone and welcome to this video on latent change score models. In this video I want to talk about the pros and cons of single and multiple indicator latent change score models. In case you're new to this channel, on this channel I present weekly stats tutorials often related to structural equation modeling and the M plus software. So if this is something that interests you then please subscribe to this channel. Also if you like this video please hit the like button. So in this video I want to talk about the pros and cons of latent change score models with either single indicators or multiple indicators of the latent variables. If you're not yet familiar with latent change score models then I suggest that you check out my other videos on this channel about latent change score models in which I talk about what they are, how they work, how you can specify them in M plus and other things. In this video here I want to um, focus on pros and cons of using versions of these models that either have only one observed variable at each measurement occasion or multiple repeatedly measured indicators of the latent variables. Here you can see an example of a single indicator latent change score model. You find a model like this often discussed in the works by John McArdle and colleagues who discussed models like this and also other models with multiple indicators. And so in this model you have only one observed variable y1 that is repeatedly measured then y2 at time 2, y3 at time 3, y4 at time 4. It's always the same measured variable or the same score for example an intelligence test score or something like that or an anxiety test score and you model latent changes based on this single indicator. Now that by itself is already pretty magic because um, normally we do need multiple indicators to identify latent variable models and so it's kind of magical that it works in this way at all and the reason why it works is because we have multiple time points and we have this kind of autoregressive structure or simplex structure here in this model that allows us to identify the latent variable parameters even though we have only a single indicator. And so this is what a latent change score model looks um, like with a single indicator. You can see that we have those true score variables or latent state variables at each time point and then we have the change score variables here as indicated by tau2 minus tau1, tau3 minus tau2, tau4 minus tau3. And a model like this works if you or can work if you have at least four time points then you can model changes in latent variables meaning you can correct for measurement error even if you have just a single indicator. Now what does a multiple indicator latent change score model look like? In a multiple indicator latent change score model as you can see here at the bottom you have a structure with more than one observed variable that is repeatedly measured so instead of just having y1 we also have now y2 and y3 and they're all measured at each time point so that we have the same three indicators at each measurement occasion. You can see the latent structure here, or the structural model is the same as um, for the single indicator model. It can be the same, it doesn't have to be the same, but it can be the same kind of structure where we have our latent change score variables here and where they are regressed on the immediately preceding state so to say or the immediately preceding latent variable and we have these residuals as well here because um, the latent change score variables typically do not depend perfectly on the previous state there's some residual variance in these so this is what a multiple indicator model looks like and you find this discussed a lot in works by um, Rolf Steyer and colleagues, also Tenko Raykov, who focus more on multiple indicator models than the group um, around John McArdle. And so you'll find that in the 90s already, Tenko Raykov and Rolf Steyer published latent change score models with multiple indicators. And the question then, of course, that many people ask is what should I use? Should I go with this approach that has just a single indicator or a single sum score? or should I use multiple indicators? And so I want to now discuss some of the pros and cons of each approach. So obviously with a single indicator model, 
probably the biggest advantage or the most obvious advantage is that you only need to have one measure that is repeatedly observed. So one score, one test, one questionnaire, one item or something like that. And of course that can have advantages when it might be costly to do a longitudinal study with multiple indicators. Furthermore, as you saw in the slide, the model is a little bit more compact and less complex due to having only one indicator at each time point. So this makes it maybe easier to specify, a little easier to report in a paper or something like that because the model as such is smaller. But that's already pretty much where the advantages of single indicator models end, in my opinion. So I couldn't really think of a lot more advantages of that approach, but I could think of a lot of cons, actually, of those single indicator models. So what are the cons? First of all, you need to have at least four time points for identification of such a model, unless you make very restrictive and fairly unrestrictive fairly unrealistic assumptions about the model. So that is something that could be a downside if you can't collect data on four time points. Also, when we have many time points, oftentimes people drop out, you have more missing data, so that could be a disadvantage. And even with four time points, the single indicator approach requires potentially unrealistic constraints to be implemented for identification. For example, you have to put constraints on the error, on the measurement error variances. You have to constrain them to be time invariant for the model to be identified, or you have to put other constraints in that may be unrealistic also. Having equal measurement error variances in longitudinal studies is something that, in my opinion, often does not work, is not realistic. Oftentimes the error variance could be a little bit higher at the first measurement occasion when people have to get used to the procedure. And so this is often something that we don't see in empirical data, that we have the stationarity of the measurement error variances. So that could be violated. However, you have to have that constraint or another a similarly unrealistic constraint in the model. Otherwise, it wouldn't be identified. Related to that issue is um, the problem that with a single indicator you cannot test a fundamental assumption make, made when you analyze latent change, and that is that there's measurement equivalence across time, meaning that you have equal origin and equal units of measurement across time. So intercepts and factor loadings should be tested for measurement equivalence. However, in the single indicator model, the intercepts have to be fixed to zero and the loadings have to be fixed to one at each measurement occasion for identification. So these are forced to be the same across time. So they're forced to be invariant. However, this isn't a testable constraint because these constraints are required for the model to be identifiable. So we can't really test that we have measurement equivalence across time. We just have to assume that that is the case. Furthermore, in the single indicator approach, you have to have this kind of autoregressive structure for identification. So you cannot just simply allow those latent change score variables to all be freely correlated. You have to have a specific structure where the change score variables are regressed on the previous state because that kind of autoregressive structure is also required for identification. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing or an unrealistic thing. However, it is some, um, it makes the analysis less flexible than if you could just simply allow those change score variables to be freely correlated if you wanted to do that. The model also implies that the one and only measure that you are using or the one item that you're using is kind of the gold standard, that there's nothing else, so to say, that needs to be looked at. This is the score that um, defines the construct, and that could be fine, that could be realistic or not. With a multiple indicator approach, you could see kind of which of the measures is the one that maybe should be used or that is a marker indicator or how different different measurements are, different items are in terms of 
their uh, representation of the construct. And so this is not something that you could test with a single indicator. You just simply have to assume that this is the um, way to go, that this is the indicator that you should use, and you can't really study differences between different indicators. Also, in my experience, with a single indicator, even though identified in principle, this model tends to be less stable when you estimate it, meaning there can be more uh, frequent estimation problems with this model than with a model that uses multiple indicators, because the the uh, identification of a single indicator model is kind of shaky when we have only one indicator of a latent variable and we estimate a lot of latent parameters, then naturally this can come with a higher rate of estimation issues. Now let's talk about something positive again. What are the pros of using multiple indicator models? Multiple indicator models Maybe the most serious advantage is that the model adds flexibility in terms of the number of time points required. When you have multiple indicators, you can do a change score model already with just two time points. You don't need to have four. So it's already identifiable with just two time points. And that's a big advantage, as we know, because longitudinal studies can be costly. And so fewer time points could mean an advantage. You also are not required to put so many constraints, especially not ones that are um, unrealistic or that could be unrealistic. So for example, we don't have to constrain error variances to be equal across time for the same indicator. That is not a required constraint. If it is a constraint that holds true for your data, then that's great. You know, you can test it. You can see if you have equal error variances across time. If you do, then that saves parameters and you get more degrees of freedom and that a more parsimonious model. So it's definitely not bad, but it's not something that you are required to have in there. And with multiple indicators, you can test whether measurement equivalence holds across time or not, because with multiple indicators, you can test whether the intercepts and factor loadings of non-marker indicators are time invariant or not, whether they vary across time or not. That can be formally tested in terms of, for example, chi-square difference tests, nested model tests, and stuff like that. So that's a big advantage because it allows us to test an underlying assumption of latent change score analysis. We also don't have to have a regression structure in the structural part of the model with multiple indicators, meaning you don't have to regress the change score variables on the previous state if you don't want to do that, because you could just simply estimate all the covariances among the change score variables and all the covariances of the change score variables with other, with the state variables, those could just all be freely estimated instead of having this um, more restricted autoregressive structure. And then since you have multiple indicators, you can also study their heterogeneity. So when we have different indicators, they might reflect slightly different aspects of a construct or more different aspects of a construct. And this is something that you can then examine as opposed to having just one indicator where you have to just use what you have. Here in this case, you can then find out how homogenous the indicators are, what different facets of a construct they might represent, whether they're method effects, indicator-specific effects, and something like that. With multiple indicators, you also have a greater stability in model estimation. On average, there are fewer problems that happen, in my experience, and also as shown by simulation studies, when you have multiple indicators, as long as those are good indicators of your latent variables, those models tend to be more stable than models that have fewer indicators or only a single indicator. There are also some cons, though, to multiple indicator models. One is that Obviously, you have to have more than one indicator. So sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes you have studies where you're so limited in terms of the funding or the time that you can administer only one item per construct. Then you can't do it. If you have only one item, then you couldn't uh, 
use a multiple indicator model, obviously. However, oftentimes we have multi-item scales, at least short scales, where we have, let's say, maybe three items per construct or four items. Then maybe you could use the items as indicators um, of latent variables so that you still could go with multiple indicators. In that case, though, if you have ordinal items, then you should use methods for ordinal factor analysis or robust maximum likelihood estimation that deals with the non-normal data that we have to deal with, with ordinal indicators. Also, multiple indicator models are more complex. You have, due to having multiple indicators, you have a larger model. You also have potentially heterogeneity in your indicators, which means you might have to include method factors or indicator-specific factors or something like correlated measurement error variables across time to account for indicator heterogeneity that can make your model more complicated. It can also be harder to fit it or to, to specify the model in a way that it fits well. There could be some interpretation issues when you have correlated errors and so it just becomes more complicated and that's maybe the biggest downside of using multiple indicator models. In summary though, I would argue that multiple indicator models are the way to go because they add more flexibility to your analysis, they are more stable, they allow you to find out more about your data than single indicator models. And so whenever possible, I would say prefer multiple indicator models. And that's, by the way, not just something um, to think about when you run latent change score models, but also with growth curve models. Growth curve models can also be specified for multiple indicators, and all the advantages are basically the same, um, like the ones that I discussed here, when you use multiple indicator or second order growth curve models instead of single indicator growth curve models, you have the same advantages um, as here for the latent change score models. And similarly, when you do something like autoregressive models, when you do latent state trait models, it is generally beneficial to use multiple indicators for all these classes of longitudinal models. I hope you liked this video. This was maybe a somewhat controversial topic, so if you have a different opinion, if you have some pros and cons that I forgot to mention here or that, um, that uh, you have a different opinion about, then please leave a comment in the comment section. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel, like this video if you did like it, and check out the description for additional resources, and I'll see you next time.